Hi, welcome. My name is James Archery. I'm with IBM, and we have, as you guys are probably familiar now, it's because it's our fourth installment of the Watson Made Simple with Tan May. Oh wait, I stole your thunder. It's your name. That's Tim. <laughs> Go ahead and introduce yourself again. Sure. So, uh, as you now know, my name is Tan May Bakshi, uh, and so uh, starting off, welcome to the fourth episode of a Watson Made Simple with Tan May. Now, today is actually going to be a very, very special episode because we've got some very, very special stuff to show you. Uh, now, I've been able to use Darvis and the actual deep learning behind Keras, and I'm going to show you how to build a visual recognition application. But not only do we have something special to show you today. We have someone special to show you today. Uh, and so, as I've been saying for the past few episodes, we're going to be having some special guests on the show this year. But today, we actually have a special guest on the show. And who can guess what it might be? Well, today, is it, is it, is it, is we've it got... Our joint mentor? Is, I think it may be our joint mentor, right? Correct. It's our joint mentor. My mentor, James Mentor, Rob High. He's an IBM fellow and the CTO and vice president of IBM Watson. I'd like to welcome him on to Watson Made Simple. And of course, he actually made it here to Toronto. I mean, I mean, thank yeah. you for actually making it to Toronto in the midst of a hurricane in Austin. Yeah, I had um, to commute out of there. I had to where, <laughs> yeah, uh, in the midst of, you know, all the meetings that he's got and everything. So thank you yeah. for, for joining yeah, us yeah, at Watson yeah. Made Simple. And I really uh, shouldn't joke about all the problems going on down in Houston because uh, I know yeah. this guy are really having a tough time. Oh, yes. Uh, but would you like to uh, quickly uh, sort of introduce yourself uh, sure. and uh, tell everyone a little bit about what you do? Okay. Yeah, I'm Rob High. I'm the CTO for IBM Watson. I have uh, been with the team now for about four and a half years, uh, helping drive some of the technical strategy, helping align across our IBM Cloud portfolio, trying to make sure that we got good synergies, both with what we have as well as where, where we're going. That sounds absolutely great, and I think the topic of today's Watson Made Simple episode will definitely get you interested, because today we're talking about the deep learning that goes behind systems like IBM Watson. So we're going to be talking about something by IBM Research called DARVIS, which stands for Deep Augmented Representation, Visualization, and Verification of Deep Learning Models. And in essence, what that all sums up is that you can build, train, validate, test, and save your own deep learning models with a Keras Tiano or Keras back or Keras front end uh, with a Tiano or TensorFlow back end or CAF code or Torch code uh, or Torch I believe is still being implemented right now. So uh, no, no, not, not Torch just yet. <laughs> uh, but it is currently an IBM research project and I would also like to say a big thank you to the developers of IBM's Darvis for actually making this possible. In fact, we've got some more special guests on the show and if you've got any questions for the Darvis team, please do keep them in mind because at the end of this session and at the end of this show, we're going to be joined by Anush Sankaran, Naveen Panwar, and Shreya Kar uh, but to actually answer your questions about Darvis and tell us a bit more about Darvis itself. Uh, so that's what we're going to be doing next, though. Let's talk a little bit more about what Darvis can actually do. Uh, well, in essence, the point of Darvis is to make it simple uh, for you to build, train, validate, test and save your deep learning models. Uh, and so uh, essentially, re right now you know that when developers want to get in deep learning, uh, it's very hard for them because, yeah. uh, I mean, you've got all these barriers to overcome. You've got to learn you know, the language that you'd like to code in. For example, Python if you're working with Tiano or TensorFlow, Lua if you're working with Torch, mm -hmm. C if you're working with CAF. Uh, and then on top of that, you've got the barrier of entry to deep learning itself. Mm -hmm. And so you have to learn about all these different model types, all the layers, how to build these models. You have to go to read, you've got to read these papers. There's so many barriers of entry. But Darvis tries to take all of that and really simplify it for the end developer, for them to be able to incorporate deep learning into their apps in a very, very simple way. It's really a, like an IDE for data scientists. Isn't Quite it? literally. Yeah. In fact, it, you could say it's a rapid development environment mm -hmm. in this case. You're rapidly developing deep learning models that you can keep on testing with, keep on experimenting the models with, keep prototyping with until you found the right, the, the right model for you and your use case. And in fact, to show you a very simple example of how Darvis can actually tie in with deep learning and how you can build an entire end-to-end -end system. I'd like to show you how you can build a dog cat classifier using Darvis and a TensorFlow backend cross code. Because we know that telling the difference between dogs and cats is a really important <laughs> thing. We all do that. Oh, well. <laughs> I struggle with it daily, guys. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> it's easier for humans. It's easy for humans. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, very good point. 
But yeah. uh, you can never implement uh, a cat dog classifier without some sort of computer vision algorithm or technique. And the ones that have found the greatest success so far is, of course, deep learning systems. Because, you know, with these other sorts of, you know, uh, other algorithms that we've got com for computer vision, you can reach up to a certain accuracy, but then more data just doesn't help them get better. But with neural networks, more data, better models actually do help them get better and better as you train them, in, at right. least in theory. And in all seriousness, even though this is about dogs and cats, you can take the same idea and apply exactly. it to almost anything that we experience in real life where there is exactly. in fact, perhaps a lot more need to go solve those for problems, exactly. for business problems, for social problems. Exactly. There's a exactly. huge range of things here that this could be applied to. Precisely. Uh, and so there are a few more interesting use cases which we'll talk about in a bit once I show you how to build this application. But I won't just leave you at that. I won't just leave you at the back end that's built in Python. No, in fact, I'll show you how to take that saved model from Darvis and convert it to a core ML model, and how you can implement a front end for this deep learning model in Swift. But before we continue, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, what in the world is core ML? Well, in essence, Core ML uh, is a library by Apple. It's currently in beta, and as the tradition goes, in September it'll be released. Um, and so, in essence, Core ML uh, allows you to create, or not create, uh, take GPU or um, deep learning models that have been trained on GPU-enabled hardware, or hardware that's you know powerful enough to train the models. And essentially, it allows you to run inference tasks against that model on iOS devices like iPhones and iPads and other iOS devices that support iOS 11. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, in fact, this actually uses Metal 2 in the back end. So you're getting very, very fast GPU acceleration performance. And so you'll be able to do your inference very, very fast on even some really, really deep models. Uh, now I have been emphasizing, though, uh, that Darvis lets you build your own models, which is really the hardest part. Training it is just you know a few lines of code and do the data pre-processing and everything. But really the hardest part is building that model, finding out how to build it and actually getting those suggestions on what to build it within your model. Uh, and so what, in, what exactly does the custom model that we're building today look like? Uh, well, today's model is actually uh, quite deep. Uh, it's essentially if you were to take the VGGNet convolutional neural network and if you were to minify that a little bit and personalize it towards cat-dog classification. I do know that some people, though, do like to you know, take pre-trained CNNs like ImageNet and actually fine-tune them towards cat-dog classification with, for example, the Kaggle data set that we're currently using. Uh, however, I'm actually going ahead uh, and custom training it for now to keep it really simple for you and to show you how Darvis works. So explain why, why VGG. Why VGG? Sure, definitely. Now, if you think about it, VGG, uh, it's sort of this uh, middle between something like Inception, uh, and if you were to go really primitive, then AlexNet. Mm -hmm. Because you see, the thing is, uh, Inception is extremely deep. Mm -hmm. right? to, to actually process on it, you need a lot of performance. Mm -hmm. There are too many layers. Uh, and you can actually achieve better performance by pruning or whatever you might want to do. Uh, but still, it, it's, it's very computationally expensive. AlexNet's too primitive nowadays, mm -hmm. at least. Uh, and so VGG is sort of that uh, nice in between, where with VGG, uh, what you're doing is you're not you're not very computationally expensive, and especially once I minify it to work with uh, my data set. Uh, but yet, it's very very accurate in the way that it's structured. In fact, this is how it's structured. This is a model diagram of what the neural network looks like. Now, I know you probably can't see this. It's way too long for you to possibly see it. So I've broken it down into chunks. And this is the very first chunk within the neural network. Now, essentially, each chunk will take the data from the last chunk and then actually go ahead and do more processing on it. Uh, but as you can see, on the top of this model, you can see that there's a little dotted line. Dotted line just means uh, coming from the last slide. The first one actually means that we're taking input from the user. Uh, and originally, I was actually looking at creating an inception style net, but again, too computationally expensive. Uh, so the uh, input vector size is actually 299 by 299 RGB image, meaning three channels. Uh, and essentially, the first block over here, what it'll do is it's got two convolution 2D layers with a dropout of 35% in between. I just found 35% to be a good sort of midway. Uh, not too much dropout to the point that it underfits and not uh, too less to the point that it overfits. 
a good start point rule of thumb. Exactly. Yeah. And, exactly. And Tammy, before we go further down this this, sure. this, this route, yes. um, for other people, you know, I love that you explained a little bit about VGG. Yes. But also, you know, convolutional neural networks. Like, if someone's never heard of that before, mm. yes. What mm. what is it? What's the value behind that? Mm. Sure, definitely. Uh, now, in essence, what I'll first say though is, if you've not heard of convolutional neural networks, then you haven't been listening uh, to the prior <laughs> three segments. Uh, <laughs> so you should need to go look at those. <laughs> <laughs> and, and not just that. I think in, in that case, uh, if you haven't heard of these neural networks, then the use case that you're trying to probably program in. Uh, is a little bit more simple to the point that you don't need to implement these and you can go ahead with something like Watson Visual Recognition, which is very, very robust, uh, as you know, of course, uh, to the point uh, that we can easily do this cat-dog classification with visual recognition. It's just that to show you how you can do things like convolutional autoencoders, how you can do really custom things, like for example, paraphrase detection, which I'll mm -hmm. talk about in a little while as well, mm -hmm. uh, and how you can do other tasks like that, uh, Darviz becomes very, very important because then you can design your own deep learning models. Kind but gives in you a case, way of kind of getting underneath what's really inside some of these services. Exactly. But oh, get back to James' comment. So CNNs yeah. are? Exactly. Well, uh, CNN stands for Convolutional Neural Network. And in essence, what they do, I won't get into too much detail as we can go really deep into this. Mm -hmm. uh, but essentially, they consist of a few different types of layers, uh, convolution, max pooling, all these sorts of things. But basically, these convolutional neural networks try and, try and take images, for example, an image of a cat or a dog, and they try and find individual features in these images. For example, uh, if you were to have, say, three layers deep convolutional neural network, and if you were to train it to recognize ca uh, either cats and dogs or, say, uh, a school bus and an airplane, right? And what will happen is the convolutional neural network will eventually generalize to these concepts after training with, say, backpropagation. Mm -hmm. And it'll generalize to, say, the first layer. All right, it'll it'll automatically start detecting things like edges and little curves features. and little little tiny really well defined features. Mm -hmm. The second layer though gets a little bit more abstract. Mm -hmm. It'll try and find groups mm -hmm. of layer groups of edges, groups of curves that might make something that resembles a tire or resembles a, resembles a jet uh, a jet engine or mm -hmm. something that resembles an airliner's you know body or something that resembles a, a tail, something of that sort. Uh, then the third layer will get even more abstract. It'll try and it'll try and find combinations of all all of those as well. Uh, and so in <laughs> what'll happen uh, is then let's just say that uh, the last layer looked at the tail, it looked at the tire, it looked at the jet engine, it'll try and find combinations of those and it'll try and find entire airplanes for example. Uh, and it tries to represent that image in as many ways as it can and it reduces the dimensionality of the images as it goes along. And so we're removing noise, keeping the signal, removing noise, keeping the signal and only keeping the most important signal, none of the unnecessary signal. And then from there, once the convolutional neural network has done that, reduce it to a very small vector, or not very small, sometimes it can be you know, a few thousand or a few hundred thousand uh, vectors long, or, or individual numbers long, uh, and so that would make a, a big vector. Uh, after that, uh, that would go into, say, a dense neural network, or fully connected layers. Uh, and so these will act as a regular sort of classification neural network, and they'll try and take all of the features of the convolutional neural network extracted, and it'll try and actually classify classify them using a neural network uh, into, of course, categories. And in this case, our categories are cat and dog, but in the example that I was just giving, it would be school, bus, or airplane, or, or whatever else whatever you may train it on. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Right. And of course, this is a little bit metaphorical, so you're actually applying yeah. some, some references to things that we as human beings would recognize, but exactly. in reality, the abstractions inside the neural network are a little yeah. more difficult to actually recognize. Exactly, exactly. Uh, and so that's why exactly we've got uh, such complicated algorithms like backpropagation to train them. Uh, there, were, I mean, there used to be a time uh, when we didn't have such robust training algorithms that people would go into these filters and do this thing called feature engineering, where they'd manually create features. And so, like for example, if I've got 64 features here, each one's three by three, I've got to manually go in there and make every <laughs> single feature. And the next one, I've got 128. And the next one, I've got 256. Yeah, yeah. You're creating all those features manually. And that just didn't achieve high enough accuracy because humans, okay, they're good at feature engineering. They're they have years of experience in feature engineering, still they're unable to achieve that type of performance and the type of accuracy that a computer can reach just by looking at all the input examples and trying to find features yeah, within yeah, them. In fact, it's very time consuming. I mean, part yeah, of the problem, exactly. of course, is that you have to try and error 
trial and error, each exactly, one of these, right? Exactly. You try it, you see what kind of accuracy improvement you get. Exactly. If that works, you're right, you try to do error detection, you go back and revise the, uh, the feature analysis. Exactly. Um, I mean, it's literally what took four and a half years for the Watson for Jeopardy team to actually come up with a system that was able to compete yeah. at the levels that it was, exactly, because exactly. all that time was spent really trying to come down yeah. to the right set of features, right? Exactly, exactly. And then from there, how we can actually have these computed approach help us yeah. out there is yeah. really amazing. So we've moved well beyond that at this point. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Uh, but getting back to the model. Uh, so that was definitely a master class <laughs> on what convolutional neural networks are. <laughs> Go read his book. Yeah. And there's, there's more to come. I've only explained convolutional layers so far, so there's more to come. Uh, but uh, for now, though, as I mentioned, we've got two convolutional 2D layers. 2D just means two-dimensional. Mm -hmm. We're not working with one-dimensional data. We're working with a two-dimensional image. Uh, now, essentially, the first two convolutional 2D layers that I've got in this model will actually cr take in one image, the actual image of the cat or dog, and it'll convert it to 64 different representations of that image. And these, these representations are created by filters. And these filters are three by three little pixel groups that try and find individual features in sections of an image. I won't explain how it does things like strides and everything right now, but in essence, it converts the image input into 64 different versions of itself. Uh, each filter, uh, in this case, is as, as you see, can, can see, uh, a three by three filter. You can actually choose really whatever size you like. Uh, depends on on exactly what your neural network is and how it works and what data you're working with. You kind of uh, but right. in this right. case, yeah, I've inherited this from VGG and it works well with cats and dogs. So I've gone with a three by three filter size. Uh, of course, we're using the rectified linear unit activation, which will basically just take negative numbers and convert them to zero. Uh, and so uh, you don't need to know too much about that. It's all right. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, those CONV2D layers will essentially do that. And of course, in between, we've added dropout. If you're mm -hmm. familiar with how neural networks work, they prevent overfitting by, for example, randomly during training only, not inference. Uh, they'll take some of the neurons and they'll basically just strip them out. Mm -hmm. So during one back propagation iteration, it won't actually train those neurons meaning they retain their older knowledge, meaning it doesn't overfit to one specific class or one specific, you know, or the training set itself. Uh, and so we've got neural networks that don't over or underfit when you've got a good probability, like 35%. And just quickly, fit, underfit, overfit is really the, the, yes, the yes. probability that it's going to only understand those kinds of images exactly, that it's trained on exactly. as opposed to all the other variations that we're likely to exactly, get exposed to like, Exactly. Like, for example, let's just say there's a scenario in which uh, cats are much more common on Earth than dogs. Uh, as a human, you've seen more cats than you have dogs, all right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so you are able to still recognize, though, that when you see a dog, it's a dog. When you see a cat, it's a cat. Uh, but a neural network, when you're given this data imbalance to a neural network where you've got, say, 25% dogs and 75% cats, they're not good at this at all. It might overfit towards cats mm -hmm. and underfit towards dogs, meaning it, it really only looks at cats and will always output cat. Uh, and see, it would still gain high accuracy because in the validation set as well, you've got more cats than dogs. Okay. And if it's able to you know, get enough of those cats yeah. uh, and not enough of those dogs, it still has high enough accuracy. It's a, it's, it's it's a little complicated about how it uses. Yeah. But uh, right. it, it's, if you'd like to find out more about that, it's you can on my YouTube channel. Yep. <laughs> uh, but after that, though, we've got two max pooling 2D layers. Now, what's a pooling layer? Well, in essence, a pooling layer uh, tries to take the output of a convolution 2D layer, or any sort of layer, uh, and actually reduce its dimensionality. And what it'll do is, let's just say, in this case, we've got a 3 by 3 pooling size. Uh, now, what this means is that there'll be a 3 by 3 little grid, a little window, that'll stride across the image. And every single little window of the image it takes, this is max pooling. So it'll take the maximum pixel value, mm -hmm. and it'll output it as one new pixel in an image. And so it'll reduce uh, the dimensionality of that image by quite a bit per run in it's this case. It's essentially a way of summarizing what it's seeing exactly, in that window. Exactly, exactly. So and eventually, what happens is these make the image so small that the, that the dense layers can actually handle the image and can actually handle all the data that they provide. Uh, now, usually in these sorts of CNNs, even in VGG, they only have one max pooling 2D layer. However, in this case, I've actually used two. Reason being uh, that, of course, when we don't use two, this neural network isn't deep enough to reduce the dimensionality enough to the point that the dense layers can actually understand it or work with it. Because at the end, the dense layers have such a huge trainable parameter size uh, that, of course, there's not enough complex it's data to work with. Right. And it either overfits or underfits to the training mm -hmm. data, and it's not good. So two max pooling 2D layers do reduce the noise and reduce a bit of the signal, but the neural network still understands all of the data. 
Still enough resolution. Yes, exactly, exactly. Uh, however, the next block is practically the exact same thing, just 128 filters instead of 64. Imagine how long that would take with feature engineering. Uh, and then uh, getting to 256 in the next block. Uh, and then in the next block, of course, after this, we've got more than enough uh, of the representations of the images to actually work with. And so I start my dense block. So stop there. So go back yes. and explain why the progression. So why is it sure. for 128, 256? Sure, sure, sure. Uh, now you see, we uh, the reason is that uh, I mean, in, in general, with most neural networks, what you're doing is you have filter sizes across these neural networks that increase over time. And the reason being, uh, that let's just say we've got you know one representation of the image. We don't immediately want to create 256 different representations of it, even though we're just detecting little edges, we're detecting little circles, we're detecting little you know shapes. Mm -hmm. uh, in the next layers, the abstractions might become more complex to the point that we need more filters to actually be able to represent such abstractions. And so with 64, that's just enough to handle sort of edges. Uh, then with 128, we're handling things like, are we finding some sort of long circular object, a tail? Are we yeah. finding uh, a really thin circular object, mm -hmm. a, a whisker, or something mm -hmm. of that sort? Mm -hmm. uh, and then the 256 becomes even more abstract, and it requires more ways to represent it, so it gets it right in one of those filters. And that's usually why filter sizes increase over time with these sorts of convolutional neural networks. Uh, there are some exceptions, but mostly this is how it works. Uh, there are uh, mm -hmm. little, you know, things like, for example, the uh, inception is uh, is very complicated mm -hmm. with how it works with sort of these uh, these uh, really deep models that uh, get uh, you know merged and uh, they split up and fork. Uh, but I won't be going into that right now. Uh, for now, though, but if we could just kind of make this a little bit more practical. So you know, if you think about yes. the sort of subtle distinction between a cat's arm and yes. paw versus a dog's arm and paw. Yeah. You know, how do we as human beings recognize that one looks like a cat and one looks like a dog? Yeah. Very, very subtle de subtlety, right? Exactly. The subtlety and the details. Exactly. Um, you know, maybe the right, the shape of the paw, the lack of pads or the yeah. you know, the, the extruded uh, uh, f uh, claws. Exactly. You know, those things are what's going to trigger and that's what the complexity exactly, is exactly. that we're trying to deal with. In these, uh, in these more abstract models. Exactly, exactly. And then with that abstraction comes things like, for example, it could be really, really subtle differences. Uh, in some cases, it can be very obvious. Like the color could immediately give it away. If it's yeah. this specific color, then we know it's just a dog. It yeah, can't be a yeah, cat, right? Yeah. Uh, although there are hardly any of those cases, there can be some obvious okay, givers yeah, away. Yeah. Like, for example, Stripes. size, color. Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, we could go for things like uh, eyes, the mm. shape of the face. Mm -hmm, uh, is it more mm -hmm. circular? Is it more you know, pointed? Yeah. Is it, uh, it, it really depends. And again, yeah. the more you train, the more more quality data you give it and the more fine-tuned this model is to work towards such, a, such abstractions and this actually ties in with more filters, it should be able to achieve higher accuracy. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Very good. Yes, uh, but then from there, uh, once we've got all of those representations of the image, we're ready to actually feed it into a dense block. Now the dense block, as I mentioned, will take the output of the CNNs and actually classify them using a dense neural network. Uh, of course, so I have to take the two-dimensional output of the convolutions and convert them to one-dimensional output that these that the dense layers can understand, and that's where the flattened layer comes in. The flattened layer starts off, it flattens that output, and then I have a dense layer with 1024 outputs and a sigmoid activation 1024 chosen uh, just due to uh, you know how how it, how VGG networked it went uh, 4096 4096 1024 mm -hmm. I removed the 4096 because that's way too much for me mm -hmm. to work with right now it's not that complex mm -hmm. uh, because VGG net was trained on image net so remember they needed a much more complex model and to train between exactly to thousands yeah. Yeah. yeah and so uh, for now though I just decided mm -hmm. to keep 1024 after that 30% dropout doesn't need as much dropout because it's not as prone to overfitting as the CNN uh, although theoretically it can be, uh, mm -hmm. it theoretically can be, uh, but in this case I found that 30% does work nicely. Uh, after that, I incorporated uh, a 512 d output dense with another sigmoid activation, another 30% dropout, and finally a dense layer with two outputs two. and a softmax activation. Softmax, of course, meaning that it'll give you a probability matrix as output, and so each neuron will represent the probability value of their individual class. And so, say neuron one is for cat, and neuron two is for dog, neuron one will represent the probability value for it being a cat and neuron two for dog. 
and with probability, you can really kind of think of that as being confidence. Exactly, like exactly. That. So confidence uh, is essentially what that would mean. Mm -hmm. And that's what the confidence of the neural network would be. Uh, in fact, using this, a training overnight, uh, and one more thing I'd like to add here, uh, is that I was able to achieve 94.46% ac validation accuracy. So that's actually relatively high mm -hmm. for a mm -hmm. new model that was mm -hmm. trained from scratch. Mm -hmm. uh, and so one more thing I'd like to say, though, is that this episode actually would not have been possible at all if Rob I hadn't actually uh, <laughs> given me uh, a Tesla P100 server to train these neural networks on on soft layers. So thank you very much, Rob, You're for welcome. that. You're And, that and was in this case, really we're helpful. not talking about the car. We're actually yeah. talking about <laughs> We're not talking the about the GPU. car. That's right. And you'll, you'll understand that uh, once you actually take a look at my channel, there's a new video out. You'll, you'll see that very soon. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so so I've, um, I've got some questions from like a yes. business, real world application standpoint. Yes. You know, my mind was training. I'm already thinking about, you know, the different varying details in an MRI scan, mm -hmm. right? You could, the subtleties, right? We're talking about that abstraction layers and mm -hmm. capabilities, right? Mm -hmm. I think there's applicability there, right? That's potentiality. Um, I think there's Absolutely. also, if you're working in the industrial industry, right? And you're trying to identify the rust and corrosion of your pipes and mm -hmm. looking for identifications, there, you know, there's the subtle nuances of maybe things are, are, are rusting more than they should, right? And that's a capability there. And then um, those are just some areas that I was thinking is that, is that, is that yeah, a yeah. I mean, another a company that we're working with right now that's actually using uh, visual recognition to go out and look at properties using uh, imagery that, that has been taken from the air, uh, looking across different um, properties to determine how much of that property is occupied by, by permeable uh, uh, materials. Uh, impermeable materials have, have uh, you know, swimming pools in their yards and so forth as a way of estimating how much water they're consuming. These are all visual recognition um, tasks that can be exactly. enhanced through classification and, and measurements of, mm -hmm. of what they're actually seeing in the image. Yeah, and you know what would be interesting too, especially like let's say it's a drone looking or they're taking these images, yep. you know, the abstraction is going to be so important because, okay, you may you may have a, like a, a cylinder like above ground pool, mm -hmm. right? And so it's got the blue water reflecting and whatnot. Mm -hmm. But what if it was just a tarp that someone laid out that was blue? Yeah. Right? So yeah. the importance of it, having the abstraction levels to yep. that far yeah, yeah. would yeah. have to be, yeah. it, that's where yeah. that comes out, right? Exactly. Would it just be right. like a high that's level, right. oh, that's an image. It needs to know That's more right. of the nuance. That's right. Which is why, of yeah. course, with visual recognition, you can have uh, those sorts of abstractions. But the thing is, if you want extremely deep models and very mm -hmm. specific models that are fine-tuned towards your use case, which is where you use Darvis and your own custom hardware. On IBM, of course. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> IBM Cloud. IBM yeah. Cloud, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Uh, and so from there, uh, now I'm sure a lot of you are excited. We've uh, spent around 26 minutes actually talking about the back end here. And a lot of you are actually really waiting for the source code. You want to get to the code. Let's so now, I'll listen to you. Let's actually start coding <laughs> now. Uh, and let's start, uh, I'd like to show you how exactly you can actually build this model using Darvis. Let's get started. Now, this is actually very interesting. Because if you've ever worked with IoT before, IBM IoT, or you use Node-RED in general, this IDE might seem a little bit familiar to you because this was actually based off of the open source Node-RED Flow Editor. And so that means they basically repurposed this Node-RED Editor to work with deep learning flows. And so all I really need to do to make a simple deep learning app is go ahead and go through these nodes. There's an image data node. And so this will actually give my model input. I just open this, I just drag that into my flow, double click it, give it my properties. For example, my image size is 299 by 299. Oh, not 99 channels, three channels because RGB, red, green, blue, uh, meaning it's, an, uh, it's a colored image. Uh, data format, in this case, is folder of images. In fact, uh, fun fact here, uh, they actually incorporated the folder of images feature when I requested for that in one of my videos because I prefer working with folders mm -hmm. of images. So mm -hmm. thank you for implementing that. Mm -hmm. uh, of, of, apart from that, though, batch size, 16. Again, uh, you can uh, set this to whatever you'd like to. In this case, I'm working with 16. Uh, you can give it where exactly you'd like, to you'd like it to find your data. Uh, in this case, I'll do slash root slash cat dog. Uh, and make sure you put the slash in the end because they don't uh, use the uh, actual you know, path append. It's just um, plus, plus the folder name. So make sure you put a slash at the end there. Uh, I'm just going to give the same data for validation and testing since I'm not going to differentiate between them. That'll become too much data. Uh, but for now, we're going to go for the same data with validation and testing just to see what our accuracy looks like. Uh, but training is, of course, separate. Uh, from there, you can give it some data augmentation properties. Uh, for example, you can tell 
tell it, uh, like, let's just say that you have a very limited data set. Like, for example, we've only got uh, around 11,999 uh, images uh, per class. And so that's, uh, I mean, if we were to multiply that, uh, that's 23,998 images, mm. which is relatively limited for CNN. Mm -hmm. CNN's like billions of, uh, I mean, the more you give them, they're, they're happy with as much as you give them. Uh, and so uh, they never have enough. Um, and so uh, with these CNN, sometimes if you want more data, you can actually do data augmentation, especially with Keras. Uh, and so that'll allow you uh, to essentially do things like scale the image a bit, flip it, rotate it, crop it a little bit. So it means the same thing, but it's a different representation of it so you have less overfitting and more data to train with. Uh, from there, though, I won't change this right now. That'll get a little bit too complicated. We'll click on Done. As you can see, the error is gone. And I can actually go ahead and start building the model itself. I'll start off with a convolution layer. Now, as you can see, by default, it does tell us 64 filters, 3 by 3 kernel size, uh, or in this or filter size, you could say. Uh, we're not going to change the stride at all. Border mode, valid initialization, uh, bias, trainable. Uh, but what you need to care about is the tensor dimensionality. Because the thing is, if you're working with Tiano, then you need to set this to TH, because the thing is with mm -hmm. Tiano, your channels come before your image size. Mm -hmm. uh, but with TensorFlow, your channels come after your image size. It's, 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 yeah, con it's, it's confusing when you work with Keras, yeah. because yeah. then it works with both backends. But whatever else it might be, uh, in this case, I'm working with TensorFlow, uh, as, it, uh, as, I prefer, as I prefer its performance. Uh, so I'm going to click on TensorFlow, click on Done, and there we go. We've got the first layer ready. <laughs> this should be exciting. In fact, everybody can actually follow along as I build this model, so you can actually uh, follow you can do along yourself, with absolutely. Yeah. Exactly. And in fact, it's completely free to sign up for. You yeah. just go to darviz.mybluemix.net, sign in with a Google account, and there you go. You've got yeah. Darviz. Yep. From there, though, let's add an activation. In this case, a rectify linear unit. I'll drag in the ReLU layer, and I'll go ahead and drag in a pooling layer. It is. There you go. The pooling layer will have a 3x3 three three filter size in this case, and we'll add one more of those pooling layers. Now, before we continue here, though, as you can see, I've made a mistake. I forgot my second Convolution 2D layer. Again, this is based off of the extremely powerful Node-RED editor. So I'm going to take my Convolution 2D layer, drag it in between these two layers, and there we go. I've Boom. automatically made my connections. Done. I can actually drag these to the side to make this a little bit uh, neater. Uh, and there we go. We've got that. In fact, I also forgot my activation. So I'm going to take my Rectify Linear Unit, drag it in between, and there we go. Just like that, we've got the activation. And there we go. The first batch of layers is complete. Pretty now, good. quite literally, all we need to do is take all these layers, copy and paste, drag them down, and make the connection. That's it. I just make this connection, change the filters filter to size, 128. Yeah. Yep. We'll keep the filter size the same, but the uh, amount of filters will change to 128. Uh, then copy and paste once more, change it to 256. And we should have our CNN model. Drag that there, changes to 256, 256, and there we go. We've got the model. Now the dense layers. Of course, it does have the support for, for example, over here, the flatten layer. So we're going to drag from pooling to flatten. All right. Uh, from there, we can also go ahead and take a dense layer. That's what it's called. Uh, we can take the dense layer. Of course, we're going to start out with 1024 nodes. Uh, and we'll also have a sigmoid activation. Didn't forget it this time. Uh -huh. And copy and paste. Move that over there. Make the connection. It's mm -hmm. that simple. Change it to 512. Just like that. Copy and paste. Move this over. Move these over. Two outputs. Moves, oh, <laughs> remove sigmoid, replace what? it with softmax, make the connections, and there you go. You've got your model. There it is. That's how simple Done. it is. Yeah. You've got your model like that. Really uh, nice. And then all you need to do is take in an accuracy layer as a metric to calculate the accuracy. You see how well you're doing? There you go. There you You've go. got it. You've got your entire model completely ready. And if you click on save on the top right, as you can see, the unicorn is satisfied and Darviz likes the model. There are no errors. Uh, and theoretically, we should be able to convert this to source code. 
Now, this is the really, really interesting part. So if I click on this little blue arrow over, oh, arrow over here, and if I click on Create Source Code, of course, Darv is, uh, is, is based off of Node Red. It gives you this, these really great uh, random names to begin with. <laughs> uh, for example, uh, for uh, the model I was just working on a little while ago is uh, admiring uh, Arding Heli, and this one that, I would, that we just worked on was uh, Jovial Sanusi. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, Clear I'm not going obvious. to change it. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so I'll just give it a job name. Uh, this is a job name for creating source code. I'll just take the first two uh, letters of both words, uh, J-O-S-I, and then give it a job uh, ID, one. Uh, I'll choose a platform, TensorFlow in this case. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll work with, har I'll choose the hardware availability. In this case, I've got a GPU. GPU. Uh, That's right. Thank you. Uh, and then I'll create my job. And as you can see, within a few seconds, theoretically, it tells me that it's like it'd like to download a file. I'm going to open this up with archive utility. And as you can see, if I open this up with Xcode, this is how many lines? Let's see. 228 lines of code that incorporate deep learning that runs on a GPU, uses TensorFlow as a back end, and cross as a front end. And I didn't need to type. A yeah. single line of that code. It's just there. It does the data yep. pre-processing. It does the model building. Everything. In fact, at the end, it even does the validation of the model and the testing of the model. Isn't that just amazing? You need to no longer spend time going through your cross code and layer by layer putting these implementations, especially with the functional API, really, 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 really hard. Not, not hard. Really, really tedious and repetitive. Cross or Darvis does all of this for you, so that you don't have to. You spend all your time, you spend your intellectual power on the actual model, model structure and how you want to design it. Exactly. Yep. You're not spending your, your, your concentration uh, more on actually building the model itself yep. instead yep. on how the model should be built. Yep. Yep. Um, so, yep, Darvis yep. is extremely useful. Uh, now, of course, though, I have to copy this over to my GPU server. Uh, and I've already copied because I don't want to do secure copy right now. Uh, and so I've already got this set up, uh, as you can see here. So but, but, um, while you do that, I do want to say one thing. So again, shout out to the Darvis team for doing yes, just an outstanding completely, job. Completely, completely. Um, I do want to remind all the viewers that this is research yes. uh, code. Yes. This is uh, a uh, what an you alpha might think version. is an alpha yeah. or experimental code. So you know, use it. I think it's really powerful. Yeah. Recognize if that you have any it's sort still of, in development yeah, and if, will if evolve. You do, um, if you do run into any issues, please do feel free to tweet to the IBM yeah. or the uh, Darvis uh, Twitter team. handle, yep. uh, and they will, yep. of course, get back to you, I'm sure, yep. uh, and actually try and fix that. In fact, I'd like to say a big thank you to Anoush from the Darvis team, because for the past few days, I've been trying to I've been trying to push the edge with what I can do with Darvis, uh, multiple inputs. I've been trying to do inception models and merging and everything, and he's been staying up all night and really helping me. Uh, I've been, you know, I haven't slept in I, <laughs> some time. Uh, yeah. uh, but uh, you know, it's, a, it's a vacation week in India. He's in a remote area yeah. with little internet access. Uh, but luckily, he was able to help me. And uh, I mean, thank you very much yeah. for that as well. And you'll yeah. be able to hear more from him uh, in just a little while as well. Uh, but as you can see, Back to the server. Uh, on this server, I have got uh, a uh, the uh, code already copied on uh, in this specific file, apc1.py. Uh, now, inside of this, as you can see, we've got all the code ready. Uh, and so all I need to do is actually run the code. However, what I will say is that the, this takes around 200 seconds per epoch. Mm -hmm. And so what that means is that when you're running with around 200 seconds per epoch and you're running, say, 100 epochs, mm -hmm. uh, that's... It's going to uh, take a little while. It's yeah. going to take a little while, a few hours. hours. Yeah. And so uh, I'm not going to spend a few hours on live stream. Uh, if you'd like to find mm -hmm. out more about that mm -hmm. and how exactly you run the code or uh, any other information, you can find that on my YouTube channel. However, for now, though, I've got a pre-trained model called Best Model VGG DC H5. There it is. Uh, and so uh, this H5 model, or this HDF5 model, uh, has been saved by Karas. And now, ready to go to the next step. The next step is actually going ahead and taking this Darvis model, this model that I built with Darvis, trained with Karas, and then saved to my disk. Now, how can we implement this in an application? We don't want to have the users check for if it's a cat or a dog in the command line, right? We can't keep secure copying and checking. Uh, how do we create a very friendly to use application behind this model or in front of this model? Especially one that's going to run on your smartphone. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> uh, and so this is where CoreML comes in.
Now, as I mentioned, Core ML allows you to run inference tasks on deep learning models pre-trained on your iPhone or iPad or other iOS device. Uh, now, in order to do this, though, you have to convert this cross model into a so into something called a Core ML model. Uh, now, the file format for this is ML model. Uh, luckily, Apple didn't invent their sort of uh, you know sort of exotic file format. Uh, they're working with protocol buffers in the back end, uh, and so if you'd like to convert really any model to, to Core ML, you just need to convert it to protocol buffers and then write your own translator uh, from protocol buffer to uh, to uh, Core ML. Core ML. Uh, however, it does have built-in support for things like Keras. Scikit-Learn, uh, and quite a few other types of models. However, one thing I'd really like to see from the Apple team, big feature request, please implement TensorFlow checkpoints. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> because you see TensorFlow checkpoints, there's a lot of hidden sort of, uh, lots of things, like for example, darknets, uh, yellow, you only look once neural network and stuff like that, mm -hmm. uh, that are only currently mainly available uh, in TensorFlow checkpoints. So if we get that on iOS, I'd be very, very satisfied with that. Uh, however, for now, we're going to work with Keras so let's get back to the point. Uh, now, as you can see, this is a simple script uh, that goes ahead and takes in a cross model, in this case, this is our model here, mm -hmm. and converts it to a CoreML model. The way it does this is by using this thing called CoreML Tools. CoreML Tools is a Python pip package by Apple. Um, and so, in essence, uh, it allows you to take cross models or other types of models uh, and convert them to CoreML models. This is actually very, very simple. It's only three lines of code. It'll automatically take the cross model uh, using this line of code here, and it'll convert it and save it using this line of code here. Um, and so as you can see, uh, it saves it to tester2.ml model. Uh, however, I've gone ahead and renamed that uh, to dogcatvgg.ml uh, model should be somewhere here. Uh, no, I actually renamed that with, from within Xcode. So you'll see that in Xcode. Uh, however, once you've got your ML model, go ahead and copy that back to your local machine, where you can continue doing iOS development. Now, this is going to be very interesting uh, because now I can actually go ahead and open up Xcode. Uh, and within Xcode, uh, implementing CoreML is as easy as one, two, three, just a bunch of clicks. That's it. Uh, that's actually what I love about CoreML. At first, I thought, okay, it would be really complicated. You're going to import the model. You're going to tell how to inference. Mm -hmm. You're going to do all this stuff. But luckily, it's mm -hmm. actually not very difficult at all. Yeah. All you do is you take your ML model file, you drag it into Xcode. Mm -hmm. Xcode generates code that will help you interface the ML model automatically. In oh. fact, as you can see over here, it recognizes that the type of the input is actually an image. Uh, and the, the dimensions are 299 by 299, and it's an RGB mm -hmm. image. And mm -hmm. the output should be a double array, uh, which with the two values. And so as you can see, it's, it's great at doing that. It automatically detects all of that. Just picked it up from the model. Yep. Exactly. Yep. Picked it up from the model uh, and generates this code over here that will help you run predictions against that model. Uh, so I won't be going into this right now, but if you'd like to uh, implement things like, uh, for example, getting the output of intermediate layers, which is another thing that I mm -hmm. hope gets easier eventually mm -hmm. with CoreML, uh, mm -hmm. you can implement that here as well. Uh, but going back to View Controller, which if you're familiar with iOS development, which I'll assume you are, you'll know what this is. Uh, and so I won't be explaining this extension to the UI image class. It's just a bunch of you know repetitive iOS code, not related to deep learning at all. Uh, in essence, it'll actually it actually has two different functions. The first one's actually uh, a, a, a a variable that'll be able to give you a CV pixel buffer uh, for UI image. I'll assume this stands for computer vision pixel buffer. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a part of CoreML, uh, and essentially the CV pixel buffer uh, will, uh, will allow us to send the image to CoreML without actually converting it to an array of pixels or anything. Mm -hmm. You just pass it as an image through the CV pixel buffer. Okay. Uh, apart from that, there's also a function that'll help us resize the UI image really easily to 299 by 299, mm -hmm. so the deep learning mm -hmm. model actually yeah, understands a, it, right. uh, of course. Uh, but from there, let's talk about view controller. And view controller conforms to the UI view controller, UI image picker controller, and UI navigation controller delegates. Uh, and to begin, we actually d uh, declare some class level constants and variables. In terms of constants, we've got the image picker itself that'll help us choose an image or actually take an image, uh, and a classifier. Uh, in this mm -hmm. case, I've named it dog, cat, final. Uh, and so I just do this. It's that simple. I, my model's name was yep. dog, cat, underscore, final, dot, ML model. Drag it into Xcode, generates the source code for you, and that's how you initialize your model. That's it. Uh, from there, I create two IB outlets that'll actually show you the confidence values 
for both the classes, the cat and the dog, using a UI progress view and a display view, which will show you the current image uh, that you just took. In fact, actually showing you the UI here, this is what the UI looks like. It'll show up in just a moment. Uh, it's actually very, very simple. Just basic, yeah. Uh, yep, just basic UI. It'll show yeah. you the image that you took over here in this UI image view. It'll show you the dog cat confidence over here and a button to actually take the picture with. Now, from there, of course, uh, in view controller, uh, within muted load, uh, the, we set the picker delegate itself. That's only done once when the view or originally loads. Uh, after that, uh, in the take picture IV action, we tell the picker that you are not allowed to do editing to the photo. Uh, the source type is a camera. It just becomes simpler with no editing and source type camera. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we present the picker uh, with an animated uh, transition and no completion handler because there's nothing we need to do after it. But you just did that for simplicity. There's no reason why you couldn't have allowed them to yeah, edit no, if they wanted to. Yeah, no, technically, yeah, we could. Well, just for simplicity because yeah. if you wanted to edit, you can. Right? Yeah, I mean, there's yeah. nothing stopping you. Just yeah. for simplicity and you know, to show the that the model is... <laughs> Yeah. Cut the paste the, uh, the the cat's paw onto the dog and <laughs> see if it still yeah. recognizes it. I mean, we could technically. Yeah. We should try that out. <laughs> yeah. uh, and then from there, of course, the image picker controller function from the UI image picker controller delegate. Uh, and so essentially what this will do is it'll take the UI image, uh, put it into a variable, uh, resize it to 299 by 299, uh, run that, uh, run, actually convert that to a buffer, first of all, a uh, CV pixel buffer using the extension, uh, and actually just do classifier.prediction. It's that easy. You do classifier dot prediction. You pass the CV pixel buffer, and you get the first output. There you it's go. That, that's yep. it. And then you, of course, force try it. And now this is bad programming practice. I should be doing, you know, the do catch. But uh, yeah. for simplicity, yeah. and because I'm assuming that you won't just pass it a nil image, um, that I'm going to force try this. Uh, and then what I'm going to do is extract the output, put them into the confidence values or confidence um, confidence uh, uh, UI progress views mm -hmm. uh, to show the user the confidence values. Uh, and I will put that image into the display view so the user knows which image they took. From there, I'll print out the predictions, and I'll dismiss the view controller. This will be animated and no completion handler. There you go. And that's all. That's quite literally all there is to it. I've already run the code, and as you can see, I'm actually going to switch over to my phone now. Mm -hmm. Now, my phone has got a version uh, of, uh, of this application, or actually this exact application running on it, and it has the CoreML model on it. It's got, uh, sometimes it takes a moment to show, but uh, it's got the CoreML model running on it. It's got everything on. Uh, and so, in theory, if the TV and the <laughs> HDMI switcher cooperate, we should be able to show you this demo. Uh, and so, if not, though, don't worry. I will show it to you via QuickTime on my Mac. Uh, so no need to worry about that if it doesn't work or it feels it like not be. cooperating. Yeah. Uh, so apparently uh, we cannot cooperate. It, it doesn't try, feel try like pulling cooperating it out, right now. It uh, just try pulling it out, pulling it back yeah. in. It might be a little bit um, uh, better it's native connection. Hey. Oh, uh, with the tape. <laughs> All right. Sorry for the technical difficulties, everyone. Just give yeah. us a one to three. Yeah. Uh, oh, just give us, uh, just right. give us a little, a uh, little bit of time uh, here. Yeah. Maybe Let's try one more input. Let's try this. All right. Maybe I was actually going to the wrong input. Let's see. Does it wish to cooperate, or should we just use QuickTime? All right. Let's use QuickTime. <laughs> so yeah. let's just switch back over to my Mac here. Uh, just the input one. Oh, that's it. That's it. Perfect. Uh, so there we go. My Mac is back on screen, theoretically. Correct. Uh, and so I should be able to then open up QuickTime Player, uh, create a new movie recording. We'll start capturing from the cam here, and then uh, I should be able to change this over to my phone, uh, as long as it's not connected to an external display like so. Because, of course, that'll only allow me to do data transfer. There we go or a power transfer, technically. Uh, and then from there, I can choose my phone as a camera. It'll show you my phone screen on my Mac, and the there demo go. can go on. <laughs> so uh, I will go ahead and search up a dog and cat in two separate Firefox windows, open this up with my phone, so you can see both at the same time. Uh, and uh, this is what it looks like now. Now let's just go over to images of cats and images of dogs. Now, Rob, which dog do you like? Which one would you prefer? Oh, let's go with the puppy. All right, yeah. sure. This one? Are we yes. Here? Got it. Perfect. <laughs> now, nice choice, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I'm going to click on Take Picture with my phone here, as you can see on QuickTime.
It shows up a new UI image picker. Uh, and as you Got can the see, entire studio. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and as you can see, I should actually be able to take a picture of this. Oh, that's not good. I clicked the space bar. Uh, all right, take a picture of the puppy and just take the picture like so. And if the model understands this, might be confused. As you can see, huge confidence yeah, value absolutely. of it being a dog. Absolutely huge. <laughs> no and this, this yeah, is how the deep learning dog. model works. And in fact, yeah. this is actually running at less than 0 0.2 seconds per inference. So this is extremely yeah, fast running on the GPU. Yep. Uh, and so from there, I can go ahead and say cat. So James, which cat do you like? <laughs> I love not the banana one, but <laughs> the banana. I'm, it uh, might confuse it. Let's just try. Let's just play around. Let's try. Yeah. I mean, it might confuse it, but I, it's, it's worth I mean, a try. It's worth a try. Let's see what it what it's generalized to. I'm not sure what that meme's supposed to mean, but the me like, <laughs> cat sitting there eating a banana, a happy banana too. <laughs> All right, so that's let's see. Cause they, then that was a little bit funny. So it we'll found it as a cat. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> there we go. It was I not confused that. by the demand banana. Again, this is the yeah. power of CNNs. They are yeah. amazing at removing noise and understanding the features that they were trained to work with. Uh, and so that is a demo of how this entire system works. I really do hope you enjoyed. Yeah. Thank you, uh, everybody. Don't leave just yet, though, because we've got a lot more coming up. Uh, so do stay tuned. Uh, until then, though, just to tell you, if you'd like to contact me, you can on any of the following social media. Uh, and of course, I'd be glad to get in touch. Apart from that, uh, Rob, if people would like to contact you, how can they actually get in touch? Get a hold of me on my LinkedIn account, which is uh, hi r h i g h r, uh, and uh, and or uh, on uh, on uh, Twitter, uh, which is Perfect. r hi there. That sounds good. Uh, apart from James, uh, okay. <laughs> All right, I'm going so to now the comments. Though, yeah. we've got the Q&A session coming up. Now, before we continue, though, I'd like to introduce you all uh, to the Darviz team. That's right, we've got some more special guests on today. Uh, not only Rob Hyde, the CTO of Watson, my mentor here, but also uh, some people, some of those from the team at Darviz. So I hope we can get them on the stream right now. Uh, hopefully, they'll be yeah. on. Uh, they're actually live calling us uh, on a Zoom session from the IBM India Research, uh, Research Lab. Uh, where I was Delhi. just, uh, oh, I mean, I believe this team's in Bangalore, oh, okay. uh, but um, I was in the deli and then we were doing a remote session there, Got which it. is how oh, I originally okay. found out about Darvis. Sorry, Sorry guys. <laughs> so, Tammy, so what actually happened? What if it's a picture of a dog and a cat? Oh, uh, well, there's only one way to find out. Let's try it. <laughs> Let's see. Again, it depends on which one is more prominent in the image, most probably, or whichever one it's more it's trained to, you know, um, yeah. or whichever one it's slightly overfitted towards. Like for example, this sort of cat. Uh, this yeah, there same, you go. Right? I mean, there's a picture of both here. So this might uh, this might stump the neural network here. Maybe it's around half half. Nope, the dog was much more prominent mm, in this case, right? So yeah. uh, we might want to choose one though where the cat might be more prominent than the dog. And most of these though, we can see that the cat is usually <laughs> less. Um, Dogs tend to be a bit dog. bigger than cats. Yeah. Uh, well, let's try something maybe like this here. Yeah. We can Ooh, try. Oh, grumpy cat. <laughs> Great. Uh, let's see. So All right, let's try landscape. I, wonder if the, I feel like the dog's going to pop up more, though. Yeah, I, I believe the dog will as well. Because again, it's much more prominent in this image. Yeah, again, it's the dog. Yeah. So again, it depends if you're able to find an image where the cat is actually more prominent than the dog. Uh, as long as the neural network hasn't slightly overfitted towards dogs, mm -hmm. which in some cases, I mean, it, it mm -hmm. will have some class imbalance, uh, then you should be able Maybe to get around half right half. here or, or there where the... Mm, yeah, this one seems uh, oh, around equal. We could try it out. That's a big dog head. <laughs> yeah. Actually, that is very big. And as you yeah, can see, still, still a dog. Yeah. Uh, so either the neural network has adjusted itself a little bit more towards the dog, uh, or mm -hmm. uh, the dog itself, as mm -hmm. you can see. I mean, the dog's head is, as you mentioned, huge in this image. Mm -hmm. um, so that might be another cause for that. So it really depends, of course, on the image and the neural network and how it was trained. Yeah, and so I think part of the experimentation, and this is really, again, going back to the beauty of Darvis, because then you go back and start experimenting exactly, with some exactly. adjustments to see whether you can't retrain this model yes. to have a little bit better Sort of, you know, yeah. equality in exactly. terms of. Uh, yeah, exactly. 
<laughs> dogs are not <laughs> more important. Exactly, exactly. Uh, but uh, then again, though, if you would like to find models that can do things like, for example, how many dogs are in the image? Where is the dog? How m is there a cat and a dog? Where are the cats? Where are the dogs? Right. Uh, if you'd like to do models like that, then you're looking for image detection, not just recognition and sort of like localization, that type of stuff. And that's where Darknet's Yellow comes in again, which I've been trying to get work on iOS. And if uh, you don't so want, if you don't want to spend all your time kind of figuring that out, yeah. then that's where visual recognition comes exactly, in because it does a lot exactly, of these things for you. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, can, can visual recognition do uh, localization now as well? Yes. Oh, uh, yes. but I think I thought that was only for the face detection by default, right? Or can uh, you do that on your own data? Yeah, no, the, I think you can. You can, but you can? Uh, yeah, okay, I believe so. Well, I, you, YouTube video is coming soon. Yeah, well, I certainly have to go back and make sure that we're not, that that's not a feature that's coming, but yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, certainly there's been a lot of work on Hopefully. that already. All right, so uh, that uh, is, of course, how visual recognition works, how Darvis ties in with it. And that was a question. Any more questions for uh, me before we get to the Darvis, or me or Rob, hi, or you, uh, until we get to Darvis? Um, from what I can tell, I think there's just a lot of people that are just, just blown away <laughs> by the capabilities that I've seen. Yes. Um, so that's definitely something that we should you know, consider and take out. Yes. Um, another thing I think, though, that we, you know, a lot of people, whether it's the fourth, first time seeing our fourth session or whatnot, you know, Tan May, I think it's still always relevant is, you know, we talk about this is, you know, for um, any age, someone getting interested in programming, yes. you know, what is your recommendation on where they start? Because, you know, they've got mm -hmm. these textbooks and whatnot, and, um, but I think you have your own perspective on it. And Rob, you probably have yours. I'd love to hear your, your guys' individually. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Uh, sure. Uh, so now, as I, as I usually mention, there are lots of different ways to do it, and it really depends on the way that you learn and the pace at which you learn. But really, what I'd mainly recommend uh, is, of course, you have to start off really simple. You have to start off small, so you start easy, uh, start playful, uh, and really learn at your own pace. Uh, what I mean by this is, like, for example, you might want to start off with something really simple, like Scratch, say, uh, block-based programming in general. And then from there, depending on how fast you learn, you might want to advance to something like, say, Swift Playgrounds, if you learn a little bit slower, uh, which, let, which is you know, sort of that perfect mix between block-based and text-based programming. It's text-based Swift, but it's still a little block-based with auto-completion, that type of stuff. Uh, apart from that, uh, if you f learn a little bit faster, you might want to straight go to a scripting language, like Python or Ruby. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then from there, you'll get to a real programming language, mm -hmm. like Swift or Java or mm -hmm. something of that sort. A real programming language. Exactly. <laughs> Shots fired for all those that are like Python people. <laughs> no, 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 I mean, I don't mean real by Python has less capability. I mean, like, scripting language <laughs> compiled programming language. Yeah, there you are. Right. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, and by definition, not, not comparatively. But there is an advantage of scripting language is it yeah, starting out is. because you can there iterate is. on it so rapidly, right? Exactly. You so don't have to worry about I think that, Yeah, I think that's actually why things like TensorFlow, Tiano, these sorts yeah. of libraries are built in scripting language. Even Torch built in the Lua scripting language. Like, these are all built in these sort of rapid development sort of languages. So you're, you're completely right. They do have the advantage there. But they're also simpler for beginners to learn with, right? Because yeah. it's, not as, it's not as strict. You you can say, in, in Python, you could say A is we'll equal to 10, then A is equal to hello, and yeah. it would say nothing. It would just yeah, redeclare yeah. it, right? right. But with giving. Swift, it would say, Wait a minute, you just reclassify. You see, exactly, it. Yeah. exactly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, yeah, so that's, that's why mm -hmm. scripting languages uh, sometimes do have that leg up. But again, it really does depend on the way that you learn, the pace at which you learn, and of course, you have to be passionate about programming. You have to program because you want to, and not because you need to, not because you want to get a job or something, because uh, you want to program and you understand really why it's important in the first place. Uh, and of course, from there, really just starting, that, starting with those small steps, starting with those easy steps, and of course, starting playful with block-based programming. I, you know, I mean, I think that last comment is exactly right on. I mean, you got to start with something you care about here. You got to have to have some passion. And what I find is that, well, you know, for a certain category of people, you know, just doing it, mm -hmm. you'll learn that you'll you'll realize that passion pretty quickly. I mean, mm -hmm. the fact that you can, especially in an iterative language like like Python, a yeah. scripting language, where you can iterate through that, I mean, just the joy of being able to sit down, yeah. take an idea, put it on a set of code try it, see what it does, and have it do something for yeah. you so rapidly, and then realize that having done that, you can now build on it. But, you know, my experience is that people kind of fall into different categories of learning style, um, and so you can't overgeneralize this. There are certainly cases where some people just learn better by reading. Mm. Um, but at the end of the day, you're not really going to know what you've read until you've done it. Hands on exactly. keyboard. So exactly. whether whether you're this, the type of person that likes to read and mm -hmm. then do, or the type of person that just learns by doing, either way, 
yeah. get there and get yeah. there as quickly exactly. as you can. Exactly. There's no substitute for Hands the fact on learning. Of, yep. you know, writing a line of code, you know, executing it and see what it does yeah. and then realize that there is either you did something wrong, you can adjust it or there's something else that you can do. You know, that whole process is what it's all about. And I don't know very many programmers who when they start that process don't get so absorbed in that. They, they find themselves doing it and hours later realizing that they've been completely engrossed and immersed in what they've been doing and didn't even know that they haven't eaten and haven't drank and haven't slept and haven't done anything else. You know, because it does sort of just take, take that little bit of passion you have and just expands on it so rapidly. Exactly, so, exactly. Um, just do it. You know? Yeah, and I think um, for me, I'm definitely at no we're close to y'all's level of programming. But for um, I'm more of the architecture, the solution behind the decisions, you know, for for customers. For me, getting started was the visual stimulation, like you know, connecting a Raspberry Pi with the LED, yeah. Yeah. and then using yeah. Node Reds, yeah. easy yeah. flow and connectabilities to yeah. you know, Watson conversation. I'm saying, and connecting it to the weather data API, yeah. and I say, you know, okay, pulling in geolocation, pulling in weather, pulling in the Watson conversation, and and then saying, okay, you know, if it's you know cold outside, yeah. You know what temperature is it in? If it's cold outside, if it comes out cold, then the yeah. light goes blue, yeah. representing yeah. cold weather. Yeah. Right. So that was like a really cool way for just me getting engaged for the, that 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 type of like, you know, quick wins or the short wins. I think that's Absolutely. another thing too. Like yeah. to your point, yeah. yeah. Tammy, you said like you got engaged in it because you saw it solve problems, mm -hmm. and then the rest just you know, we're here now today. <laughs> So, still yes. solving problems. <laughs> <laughs> it is, and you know, but like you said, I mean, just you know, the idea that with that one line of code, yeah, you can turn on a light. It's such yeah. a node red is so powerful cool for that, right? idea, yeah. you know, yeah. and it just gives you the sense of of incredible power and strength to exactly. be able to do that with that one line of code. It's and demystifying it's, programming. It is, but, it, but it's also a sense of extending yourself, yeah. right? You have control over your environment, your world. Um, Grain is all soft, but but still, it's it's just uh, and that gets you hooked, right? And then it goes from there. And, yeah. and the problems that we really want to solve are the ones that really do matter to society and to business and to kind of our world that we live in, and you know, being stewards of the world that we live in. And when you get to that level of thinking, you and realize that you can have that kind of impact through what you've learned. That is what really then takes you the rest mm -hmm. of the way. I completely agree. So do we have any more questions for us three before we get to the Darvis team? Or should we get to the I Darvis think we should team? probably get to the Darvis team, and if we have anything I'll, at the end, I'll throw it in there. All right, sounds good. So now I'd like to introduce uh, the Darvis team from the IBM India Research Lab, uh, joining us live from there. Thank you very much for being able to join today. How are you? Hi, Dinma. It's been great. Hi. Yeah. Uh, I, this is Anush uh, from uh, IBM India Research Lab. And I have some wonderful smart colleagues with me. Uh, here is Navi, and here is Shreya. Hi. Hey guys. And we three from the team. That sounds great. Now I know you've all been, you know, trying to help me for quite some time now with getting Darvis up and running, the multi-input. Uh, like for example, actually another thing that I'm trying to do with Darvis that I'd like to quickly note here is that I'm trying to build uh, using Darvis a neural network that can actually do deduplication of questions on Stack Overflow and Quora. Mm -hmm. So that's something that's coming soon. So mm -hmm. do, do be tuned out, tuned out. Sorry, mm -hmm. uh, do be uh, attentive for that uh, on my GitHub, Twitter, and YouTube. Uh, that'll be coming out soon. It'll be used. Darvis using it's Darvis. a great, great new, idea. It's yeah. a very powerful idea. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and so, of course, uh, thank you for helping me out with that. But apart from that, tell us a little bit more about Darvis. What do you think that the users or the uh, viewers should know uh, that I haven't already talked about? That's wonderful. Uh, thanks a lot for Tanmay for giving such a great introduction about Darvis. So, as Tanmay just mentioned, Darvis is just to make life easy for developers to get into deep learning. As most of us will be aware that deep learning is the go-to algorithm or the technique for solving lots of computer vision as well as natural language problems. And since more and more developers are trying to do deep learning these days, it's becoming difficult for them to write those amount of code, like 200, 300 lines of code in different libraries such as TensorFlow, Cafe, Theano, Keras, etc. So that's where this visual ID of Davis becomes highly important and useful for people to come and quickly and very intuitively design deep learning models and extract code from them. But that's not where we stop. We go even a step further, dream big, and make Darvis a little more intelligent and highly user friendly. Where if you are such, say, take this example for as a use case, right? If you are going to 
any research paper and reading what Darby's, what deep learning is about. Um, so for example, the same cats versus dog problem. If somebody has proposed a different CNN kind of a model where it gives a better performance and you're trying to read a research paper or a document or an article that explains, hey, this is the CNN model that I've used. One way is you could obviously read that article and come into Darby's and design the deep learning model by yourself. But that's too lame, right? It takes a couple of minutes of your time. We want to even save those couple of minutes and reduce it to a couple of seconds. So why don't we just upload the PDF or the document to us and we will understand what they've explained in the research paper and completely get the source code of the deep learning model that they've explained in the research paper. Darby's goes through the title, the abstract, the text of the document, the tables they have put in the document, as well as the architecture figures that we explain in the document, and completely understands what is the deep learning model they're trying to explain in the particular document and give you the deep learning model as such. Really interesting. So in essence, what you're saying uh, is that I can actually take like a paper that describes a deep learning model. Like for example, if I had a paper uh, that described uh, a model that's amazing at taking two inputs of text uh, and can actually go through an extremely deep LSTM model, uh, understand the natural language, go through you know word vectors, whatever else it might be, and can actually convert it uh, to whether or not they're duplicates. And it'll actually uh, Darvis will take that entire paper and convert it to a Darvis flow, which can then be converted to source code. Yes, and in a few seconds of time. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> it is actually quite ironic how uh, machine learning yes, how is, is... people do machine learning. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Apart from that, I, I do know there's also another feature in Darvis that allows developers to see, like, for example, uh, let's just say I have lots of convolutional layers in, in parallel or, you know, in, in, uh, one after another, and I didn't put any dropout. There, uh, Darvis gives me some suggestions. Would you like to put dropout between these layers? Uh, how's that, how does that work? So that's what we call the brain of Darvis. So Darvis is just not a dumb IDE where you just go and develop stuff. Darvis is intelligent at the back end. And as and when you're developing deep learning models, it validates your deep learning model for the given data and checks, hey, for this given data, is this the deep learning model, the right model that you're developing? Or is it some bugs or errors in the deep learning model? And very much in real time, it tells you what are the bugs as well as how to rectify those bugs. So even before you want to generate a source code for your deep learning model, it says what are the possible bugs and how do you fix them? And only after you fix them, it lets you generate the source code of deep learning. Absolutely amazing. I can imagine this being very, very powerful for, de for developers that are trying to, you know, uh, generate deep learning models for the first time, for example. Like, instead of having to, you know, actually go through and manually add dropout and manually say, okay, should I add dropout? Darvis will use, again, machine Just learning to say, yeah. you know, okay, well, you should be adding dropout here, you should be adding activation here, you should be adding this here, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so I, I think that's absolutely great how Darvis is able to do that. Do we have any more questions from the audience, James? No, not that I can see at the moment. All right. So do you have anything else to add before we go? Yes, and that's not all, Tenmay. I think I can keep you uh, interested with lots of interesting features coming in. So uh, I'm pretty much sure that like Keras and TensorFlow backend, and that's what you're comfortable with. And say, for example, I'm here working on cafe code on some problem. Say, for example, cats versus dogs problem itself. So I've written a whole deep learning model or a CNN model in cafe code and I'm trying to share it with you. And I send you the entire cafe code. And you work with TensorFlow and Keras, right? So you can probably use that code as well as a trained model. But with Darvis, you can. You just import the cafe code and get the Darvis design there. And you can export it in Keras, TensorFlow, Kiano, whatever program you want. So you can just interoperate across multiple libraries and multiple languages and get any code converted from one library to another library in just a second. Absolutely great. So I can imagine this being very easy because there are lots of models that I know that, like for example, work with you know plain cafe, plain TensorFlow, or plain Torch. And then, I mean, I'm sure that you'll eventually add uh, support for more deep learning libraries like Torch, etc. Uh, and eventually, once you do, you'll be able to convert between them. You know, convert them to Darvis flows, which can be converted to any other type of uh, deep learning library. It's going to be really, really interesting, and I cannot wait. This is going to keep me occupied for a long time. <laughs> Thank you. Which Sure. Exactly. Things don't work well in this particular language or library, then you can try a different one. Exactly, and, uh, exactly. Not have to spend all your time working through those exactly. details. Exactly. Yep. Mm -hmm. 
All right, so that sums up what we had to go through. Thank you, of course, very much to the Darvis team from IBM India for actually joining in, uh, for actually taking out the time to be with us at uh, Watson Made Simple. Uh, they've actually been on for the, in, uh, the entire uh, session mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much for joining in, everybody. Yeah, thank Come you, on. guys, and thanks for staying up late for this. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Take and care. also... Yes. And also, of course, thank you very much to uh, Rob High for of actually, course, you know, being a part of this uh, and actually making it away all the way over to Toronto for, yeah, again, yeah, yeah. tearing the hurricane and all this, all this yeah. other stuff that's going well, on. No, um, thank you for, for having me today and, and thank you for the opportunity to, do, to spend time with you and oh. get, get a chance to uh, <laughs> see some of the things that you've been doing that's uh, no. really outstanding. <laughs> thank and you again, very much. And thank you for all your support, you know, <laughs> oh, thank your, you. uh, your, uh, your interest in your, in your evangelism, your, your compassion and Thank and, you. Uh, and passion for what we're doing, I think, is really outstanding. I appreciate that. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Uh, apart from that, though, apparently that's all the questions we have from Facebook Live today. Uh, thank you very much, everybody, for joining in. Uh, that's all we had to cover in the event today. Anything else you'd like to add, James? Uh, stay tuned because we're going to see you. Oh, actually, you know what? If you're interested in seeing what else, Tammy, don't you have other events? You're speaking at? Oh, well, actually, yes, I do. Uh, and so I'm speaking actually next at the Open Source Summit uh, at the Linux Foundation, actually. Uh, and so this is September 11th to 14th. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm actually covering a lot of really interesting stuff. I'm covering uh, my new application, Deep Spade, part of Sequoia. Mm -hmm. You'll find out more about that there. Uh, you'll, I'm also talking more about Ask Tanmay in depth. I'm talking about a lot mm -hmm. of really interesting mm -hmm. machine learning applications, mm -hmm. uh, which you'll find out much more about at the Linux Summit uh, or the uh, Open Source Summit mm -hmm. by the Linux Foundation as well. Apart from that, I'm also speaking at the Big Data Ignite conference hosted uh, in Michigan. And in fact, what's going to be really interesting uh, is that James is also going to be a speaker at Big Data Ignite. So it's going to be really interesting. We're going to have, you know, shared sessions together. We're going to talk about uh, some really interesting stuff. Unfortunately, we're going to invite Rob High, but Rob High has to do something on the uh, on the 28th. So unfortunately, he's not able to join. It would have been great if we all three did a session that together. Been awesome, Rob, yeah. 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 That been, it would have been amazing. Yeah. But uh, anyway, next time, hopefully. Yeah. Yeah, that's time. right. And you still remain involved in, in the cognitive story. Yes. Right, yes, with Boo the and the story. tremendous, uh, Some tremendous really great updates coming up soon. Yep. You'll find out more soon yep. on GitHub. Yep. But that's good. Sounds great. Thank you very much. Again, thank you. Thank you very much for everyone for joining in today. That's going to be all. Goodbye. Yeah, we are also working closely on that and yes, we'll reach out to you soon on that.